Well, Merry Christmas, everyone, from your family at Eastside. This is John Hall along with Babby Mason and Ma Babby, uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too, Pastor. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Well, we love you, and we wanted to spend some time with you today and pre-record just some special thoughts around Christmas time. In a few minutes, I'll have a message for you on the the importance, the strategic importance, the eternal importance of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But with Babby here, that means music and great, great Christmas songs. And Babby, uh, thanks for just sitting down. You know, we got to do this seven years ago. I know, my first and I year remember Eastside. that. It was so I much do, fun. and I remember I was just a, I was a hot mess that day because I was crying. So I'm <laughs> going to try to behave a lot better because coming in first uh, Christmas here and having it with you, it was very, very memorable. Um, what do you want to do for us? You, 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 well, we, we heard you earlier in one of our services here for our senior adults. What, what are you going to do for us today? I think I'm going to pull out some songs that I've written lately. Uh, this first song is called No Ordinary Baby. And I wrote that just in the last year or so for the Brooklyn Tabernacle for their uh, Christmas gala that they had during COVID. Would this be the first Christmas that this has been available to choirs and this artists? Is a well, it's not even technically been released yet. Wow. So, so, we, so we're getting You're getting the, the first the first take. Well, I hope this becomes a, a new standard. I really do. I look forward to it. Have you written many Christmas songs through the years? Yeah, back in the day, I, I did a whole record. I mean, yeah. a whole album of Christmas music. Were but, there some of your originals yes. on that too? Mm -hmm. And but I continue to write, and you know, I'm easily inspired. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, I wrote uh, "No Ordinary Baby" that I'm going to do now, and then another song called "A Seat at the Stable" that I co-wrote with a songwriter friend of mine. Is that I, relatively new as well? I wrote that last year and and premiered that here at Eastside last Christmas. "A Seat at the Stable" that is available online, and uh, and then I, you know, like to sing something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Oh, we'll say red, and <laughs> something borrowed, something borrowed. <laughs> Something blue, something red and green. Yes. And, and Santa too. Why don't you just take your time and lead us in some great worship on this Christmas day as people have joined us online. I'll do it. I'll do okay. it. Well, this song is called No Ordinary Baby. And certainly, you know, being a grandmother, I know pretty babies when I see one. <laughs> but uh, Jesus was no ordinary baby. He came to save the world. And I'm glad to know that he saved me. So let me share Amen. that for you. Amen. Go ahead, please. This tiny little babe Asleep On a manger Of hay So innocent and holy God's love Came down from glory And the world Will never be the same A star Lit up the eastern sky the light of the world had arrived the shepherds came to greet him and the wise men came to seek him their king was finally here and this one thing was clear this was no ordinary babe This was no ordinary child This lowly infant in a stable Was heaven's gift to all mankind The one that God had promised Had finally come to This was no ordinary baby. He is Jesus, the Savior of the world. He walked on water, raised the dead. Again, he satisfied the hungry and he 
comforted the lowly, he's still the same today. His love will never change. This was no ordinary baby. This was no just sing uh, this beautiful worship chorus. It's the refrain of that wonderful Christmas hymn, Oh, come let us adore him, for he alone is worthy. We'll give him all the glory. We'll praise his name forever. Sing that with me. Oh, come let us
love to sing, but you love to sing Christmas carols. Oh, I do. Yeah. My favorite time of year. Yeah. I think some of the most beautiful songs uh, have, are Christmas songs. Are Christmas the songs. most beautiful lyrics and melodies. Now, we know you as a Georgia girl. You and Charles moved here many years ago, but your roots go back to Michigan. Yes. White Christmas is probably most of the time. Oh, that's a for real thing. And Jackson, Michigan, I think, is the, where, 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 where your dad was pastor for so many years. That's right. Uh, I heard you recently talk about those days and there are certain things when you get to go back that you like to revisit. Maybe you can go to a place to revisit or at least you re replay it in your mind. Past spiritual blessings and uh, moments and maybe even songs. So yes, talk about that for us. Well, both of my parents are in heaven now. Yeah. And so traditions are that much more special to me. Um, I grew up in a preacher's home and yep. in a wonderful family. My, my dad went, <laughs> pastored one church for 40 years and uh, I grew up playing the piano there for all the worship services. Yeah, I, can, I, just, I can remember my dad playing long play albums of Christmas carols of uh, groups, gospel groups, and I, and I can still remember hearing those songs Absolutely. as we were getting ready Christmas Eve. You know, yes. and, and you have those memories and it, too. And it set this tone, yeah. you know, this beautiful, uh, there's just there's something uh, almost magical and nostalgic about Christmas and yeah. music just paints that beautiful background. It's bigger than you know? life. It's yeah. bigger than life. And so I have this ritual, you know, a tradition that I practice when I go home, uh, when I go visit family, and I go home to the house where I grew up in Jackson, and I will play the music that I love from my childhood and my high school and college years on the hi-fi system. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're, you, maybe you grew up with a hi-fi system. Definitely had the hi-fi. That you, you, appliance, it, it, it takes it, up an entire side of the living room. You call an appliance, it's, it, it, you know, it's a big piece of furniture. It's a furniture, absolutely. It's huge and heavy. And oh, it was so heavy. Absolutely, and yeah. on one end was the record player. Yes. And then the eight-track tape player. Yeah. And then there was this library where you kept all your albums yeah, and your 45. somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle, uh-huh, and all of your eight-track tapes. And I would... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're dating ourselves. Oh, uh, we yeah. are. But I'm telling you, it was the best. It was just the best time. Yeah. And I would just steal away, you know, for an hour and just play all of my favorite music. And when I was in high school, I made a, I was a member of the French club. I took French in high school and we made a French record and I sang Ave Maria by Guno and, and I will pull out all of those wonderful favorite songs and play them on albums and eight tracks. And um, one of my favorite songs, and it to me is like the epitome of Christmas carols because it it incorporates the, the story and the the emotion and all that Christmas should be, the message of Christmas. And it's Sweet Little Jesus Boy mm. by Mahalia Jackson. There was only one Mahalia Jackson. Oh, there's only one. The only late, one. great Mahalia Jackson. I, I grew up on her music and yeah. played all of her music for the choir. And so that's that was like the, the culminating moment, mm -hmm. you know, for me. And I would... And so when I, you know, perform in all of my concerts, I always sing this song. And I, and I tell this story because I think it's, it's quite poignant that uh, the, first the first chapter of the book of John says that Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. Right, him not. Uh, but to those who did receive him, to those who believed upon his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's right. And I'm just so grateful that I know him, that I recognize him, and I love to tell this story. Sweet little Jesus boy, and we didn't even know who you was. It's a very powerful song. So, please sing it for I'll us. I'll sing it for you now. Get ready. This, this will move you. We 
could not see And we didn't know who you was You done told us how we is a trying Showed us how Even When You Was Dying The world treats you mean, Lord. Well, they treat me mean too. But that's how things is down here. Down, Lord. Down here We just Don't Know Who You Is Just seem Like we can't Look how we treated you But Lisa Forgive us Lord Please forgive us Lord Jesus even no it was you sweet little Jesus boy born such a long time a go well sweet sweet little holy child sweet little holy child Jesus and we didn't even know who you was. Merry Christmas, dear sister. Merry Christmas to you, my friend. God bless you. I just pray that 2023 is your best year yet. And for you. May I just may I just say say anything you'd like. In front of God and all these witnesses uh that I just appreciate so much your leadership and your steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord kind of spirit. Your your dedication to truth your dedication to preaching and teaching the word of God when others are compromising and you are, my daddy used to say flat-footed. flat-footed. You're standing flat-footed, <laughs> meaning you're, you're not going anywhere. You're, your feet are planted. 
planted, firmly planted on the word of God. And that's why we just love doing life with you. You're so sweet and kind and as we might say, back at you even more. Amen. Thank God for you. Amen. Um, Charles is sitting out here, your husband, as we're recording this. And I was thinking that it was just a year ago that we met at a restaurant with Daryl Whipple, the four of us, and we laid out the possibility of you spending this year with us. Yes. And this for me, for lots of reasons, has been one of the great gifts God's given to me, to our church, to this ministry because I think you've just taken the wonderful worship that we had prior to you being a regular here and you've taken it and added value to it. Amen. And in only a way that a seasoned veteran of faith performer, Amen. and I say that a sanctified performer as you are, only in a way that you could do. And we're just grateful. Thank you for your belief in us. You are a gift from God. You and Charles Amen. are a gift of, 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 of God, from God to us, and, and I'm, I'm grateful. Um, recently, I had an opportunity to open up God's Word with some of our senior adults here in the auditorium and at a Christmas gathering, and a great group here, and uh, just opened up from Matthew chapter 1 and shared about um, the virgin birth of Christ, which led to some other thoughts about the importance of drawing some appropriate lines and taking appropriate stands for the faith in these increasingly secular years that we're living in in our nation and our world. And uh, we recorded that and we'd like to share it with you and I hope that you'll receive it as uh, a gift to you on this Christmas morning, 2022. Let's study together on Christmas Day, the Word of God. Let's hear the word of God before we go to have some great fellowship time. Matthew chapter 1, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the, the Holy Spirit, and she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save people, his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, talking about Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up from that dream, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Two brief points here that Pastor Ken, I think, will appreciate on this Christmas Eve season. I think every Bible teacher here appreciate it and I think it's something that is very important in the life of our church as we move into the future, an increasingly secular society a changing Georgia, a changing Atlanta, a changing Cobb County. But here we sit in the midst of all that change with a consistent message. Two things I just want to mention here that pop up from the page. One concerning Jesus, his nature, and the second concerning his name. It's all wrapped up here. 
Some of you baseball trivia fans will remember in the 1980s when the Kansas City Royals went to the World Series, they had a ball player who had a most interesting name. His name was Willie Mays Akins. He was named after the great Willie Mays, but Willie Mays Akins, he played for the for the Angels, he played for the Royals and ended his career, final two years in Toronto with the Blue Jays. It became interesting as the series progressed into games two and three that Willie Mays Akins, who was a, a, a right-handed batter, really liked to get as much as he could of his body and his back foot even beyond the chalk line in the back of the battery box. And so what he would do is every time he'd come up, he'd just do everything he could to erase that batter's box line with his cleats. And it became known by games two or three that this was his routine when he got up to the plate. Had national attention. Commentators were talking about it. It's the World Series. Finally, by about game four, when Willie Mays Aikens came up to the plate for the very first time, it's true, I watched it happen live, the home plate umpire took the bat out of Willie Mays Aiken's hands, used the narrow handle of the bat, and simply took the bat and drew a line right there on the back of that batter's box. And he said to him, if you step outside that line, you're out. You're out. You know, through the years... There are times when it comes to God, his word, the person and work of Jesus Christ, his nature, his name, there are times when we simply have to draw the line and simply say, if you step outside of that line, while we'll be a good neighbor, while we'll live Jesus to you and do everything we can to express Christ in our lives to you, when it comes to fellowship, when it comes to communion, if you cross that line, you're out. Now, historically, there have been, for the last hundred plus years, five cardinal doctrines or five things, five fundamentals or essentials that we've said here at Eastside since we started with Ken and Mary years ago, times that our denomination has had to say to the rest of the believing and non-believing world that there are some things we believe in that are absolutely essential, and if you cross the line with these things, we're going to be out of fellowship. The first one I think of is the, the verbal inspiration of Scripture, that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's a non-negotiable. Years ago, a man named Harold Linsell wrote, when I graduated from high school, a book called The Battle for the Bible. And it was basically a survey, a detailed survey of how major denominations in our country walked away from the Bible. Some of that began in the 1800s with German rationalism, French deism. Some of it continued on into the years of Darwin and the promotion of evolution, the Scopes Monkey Trial. The Bible was continually diminished in the 20s and 30s. By the time you get to the 1950s, you had denominations that for years had believed this book began to teach that this book was no longer true. It leads to all kinds of problems. And what happens if you don't believe in the verbal inspiration of Scripture, that all Scripture is God breathed, what happens is it creates all kinds, if you will, of, of deviations. Deviations about some of the other essentials that we hold dear here in our church. Because you see, when it comes to these essentials, it's not only about the verbal inspiration of Scripture, but it's also about the, the, the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The virgin birth is absolutely critical, and that's what we read here, that God became man in human form, 100% God, 100% man, 100% Lord. Now, in our culture here, we might take that for granted, but I'm telling you outside the walls of these church and up and down the roads of this community, there are pastors and congregations that do not believe in the verbal inspiration of Scripture, and they question the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus. If you question the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is rock center on the Christmas message, if you question the, the verbal inspiration of Scripture, if you question, you question the virgin birth, that leads to all kinds of things, because see, the virgin birth says Jesus is different. 
Jesus is unique. Jesus is the one and only. You go into a deviation against the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, that leads to universalism. You begin to attack the, virgin, the, the, the verbal inspiration of Scripture. That leads to all kinds of redefinitions about multiple ways to heaven. It redefines marriage. Do you see where we're living? It redefines gender. All that when you walk away from the Scriptures. And some of this was being battled when Pastor Ken, if I can keep referencing you, I'll give you an honorarium today for your name, image, and likeness, all right? When he was in formation as a young preacher, these battles and debates were going on, and y'all were at East Side when that was going on in the denomination, the convention years ago. We can never take for granted these essentials. We have to fight for them. Fight for them. There's an element of wokeism out there in our culture today among a generation of my children and younger that is prevalent that do not, do not want to, to conform to what the scripture says, to challenge it. And some even under the brand of evangelicalism will begin to try to waver and meander when it comes to the issue of what marriage is. So understand the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely critical. I'll come back to that. But let me finish, if you will, these five essentials. There is the, there is the verbal inspiration of Scripture. There's the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus. And they start with these, which is very helpful to remember. The third would be the vicarious blood atonement of Jesus on the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, all human history came to that point, having to deal with the issue of sin. The Savior came. Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't a martyr's death alone. It wasn't him being a political figure, some type of controversial person. It was God in human form. He who knew no sin, virgin born, went to the cross and became sin. And that is central. Last Sunday, we proclaimed it. We'll proclaim it this Sunday. Or this, uh, uh, and then we'll proclaim it with our Christmas Eve services following that. We'll just proclaim it every week, as faithful as we can. Now, you can take this for granted and say it's always going to be this way. Uh-uh, unless we fight. You have to have some fight in you. Neighborhoods changing. Red, politically Cobb County, conservative Cobb County, church-going Cobb County. It's over. I grew up here. You know what I'm talking about. It's a new day. And if anything we have to do in our church is we need to make sure in a world that is beginning to say more and more that there are other ways to heaven, what we've got to do we stay out of the politics and we keep going forward for Jesus as Savior and Lord and that this place is a citadel that believes the Bible and believes that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. So I have to do. The vicarious blood atonement on the cross. Then, then the, a fourth essential would be a victorious resurrection. Three days later, Jesus rose again. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. That's a life-changing issue. The fifth thing that's as historic essential of our faith and we embrace here at Eastside is a vision of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now here's what I want you to know about me as we move into a brand new year. Some of you may have concerns about methods of ministry and how we deliver it. But I'm gonna tell you something. You never have to worry about our belief related to the message of God and his word. This is a non-negotiable. Right? And, and, and I'm telling you, you have to fight for it. You have to fight for it. You can fight, I, I mean, I, in my mind, I think about how it's tempted to creep in here. We have to fight for it in our school. We have to fight for it. We can never settle. We can never rest. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the word of God. And I'm not going to be the character or person who, who attempts to try to change something like that. I don't believe that, first of all, and I fear God too much to try. We are going to stay true to the word. 
And the day I find out somebody tries to teach I'm okay, you're okay as a, as a Sunday school lesson, something like that, we'll deal with that. But you have to constantly fight. There, there are things going, y'all have no idea what we have to do. As a staff, as a team, as elders, to make sure we keep that rot out of here. And it's everywhere. I want to affirm my brothers and sisters in Christ at Mount Bethel, United Methodist Church, that is now Mount Bethel Methodist Church. United Methodist Church has been fighting against these five essentials since the 1950s and 1960s. At Emory Seminary, Candler Seminary, that's where the God is Dead movement started. Go back and read the Atlanta Journal-Constitution archives, 1960s, 1970s. That's where that stuff started. There is one evangelical school still, not United Methodist, formerly hasn't been, but Asbury has stayed true to the book. Asbury and Wilmore, Kentucky, they stayed true to the book. And I just want to commend Pastor Jody Ray and the folks over there down the road from us that took a stand for the word of God, for the virgin birth, for the vicarious blood atonement. They stood for that, a vision of the second coming. And it's cost them. It cost them. It cost them major dollars. It's going to cost them people who aren't happy with them. In the church. But this, as we approach Christmas, these words here matter. And, and the moment you lose those essentials, the moment you lose the book, you, you, you know what we turn into. We see them all across the land. We turn into a club. We're not the United Way. We're not the Red Cross. They do great work. We are the church, though, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And we baptize and we witness and we have communion and we remember his body and his blood and we believe in the Great Commission, giving to missions, producing preachers, supporting causes that are biblically based. And if they're biblically based and the culture goes against it, then we have to speak about it. Sometimes that becomes a political issue. But, 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 but here's the thing. We are about reaching people for Christ. And I, and, 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 um, I, I just don't, I, what I don't, what I would, I'm, I'm, if I finish seven years, seven years, that's right. Pastor Ken, I think I'm the seventh pastor and I've just finished my seventh anniversary and you and I agree that seven is the number of perfection, right? So we go, there we go. I think I just reached disagreement with you there on that one. We have to be very conscious of the changing neighborhood and community around us. I, everybody in this room, we, 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 we were raised the same way. We, we, went, we were in America when people went to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, visitation. Lord, when Ken was here, he had training union. Sunday, it was just a whole different world. Now, we're very blessed in the culture if we get one or two visits a month from people in our church who are members. It's changed. Now, I can get all mad about it and blow steam, make people feel guilty, false, all that. All I'm going to do, I'm just, I can't do anything but proclaim his word and then make very, very sure that we never compromise on this book. Now, I know this seems to be an odd message, Merry Christmas, but I feel like it needs to be said to this generation. I don't want you to worry that we're going to go south theologically. I don't you worry we're going to become liberal. And just because we may have some methods that might not be as comfortable to you as it would have been, as it would be to uh, a younger generation, we're not going to sell out the book. We're not going to compromise on the Bible. And I close with this because the, the aroma of the room is filling up either with the Holy Spirit or the smell of garlic green beans. One of the things I can't tell. Verse 18, his nature, his nature. She became pregnant through the Holy Spirit. That is a miraculous conception. 
It's interesting when you look at the life of the Lord Jesus, just a few verses north of here in verses 1 through 17 of Matthew chapter 1, there's the human genealogy of Jesus. There's a human heredity there. But man, in verse 18, it quickly turns and there is a divine heredity there. His nature, God-man, never gonna be anyone like Jesus ever again. Never was anybody like Jesus. Jesus is the one. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Tell me more, more, more about Jesus. You've heard me say this before. Never once after a service has somebody come up to me and said, Clyde, pastor, you just talked way too much about Jesus today. Jesus did that. Jesus did that. Jesus, Jesus. Nobody does that because you can't get enough of him. And so we sing more, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness, see, more of his love who died for me. So there is his nature. And then I conclude that there is his name. Three names for Jesus here in these brief verses. In verse 18, he's called Messiah. In verse 21, he's called Jesus. And again, He's called Jesus in verse 25. In the middle of that, he is called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. So Jesus was born of a virgin, not just a young woman. Isaiah 7, 14, clearly, virgin. The word means virgin, never knew a man. In Micah chapter five, and later in the next chapter of of uh, Herod finding out about this from the wise men. In Micah chapter five, it says that this, uh, uh, Micah predicted, prophesied that this savior would be born in Bethlehem. The accuracy, the superb, supreme, sterling accuracy of the text from Old Testament, what Jesus would do in the New Testament. It boggles the human mind. What a wonderful name he is, it is. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, anointed one, Savior, Messiah. So that's about all I got to say. So I just want to make sure that we remember this virgin birth is not just a seasonal thing with us. It's an essential. Finish with this illustration I found. My wife took our three-year-old into a church service for the first time this past Christmas. Getting impatient while waiting for the service to start, he turned to her and asked, what time does Jesus get here? (laughs) That's good. Jesus is here. And Jesus came. And all the prophecies fell into place. And Jesus is coming again. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But until that time, let's be faithful. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you for the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the centrality of it related to our faith and for the history and beauty of it as it relates to Christmas in Bethlehem's manger. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless son of God, who went on the cross some 33 and a half years after this birth to take upon him all the sins that have ever been and ever would be upon his shoulders. And we just want to say thank you. Today we thank you for these dear people who in this place at Eastside have believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the music that we've heard. We thank you for the word that has been taught, for the prayers that have been offered. And we thank you for this channel, this platform online to be able to share on Christmas Day. Father, protect our church family, keep them safe on this day and the holiday season. And would you bring us all back together very, very soon, next Sunday, as we begin to celebrate a brand new year. Glory to your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.